Great sessions thus far. Let's dive deeper into technology. More importantly, how you can leverage technology in your sales process. This is both for BGAs and independent advisors. Data security, best practices, and digital tools. This is taught by a fantastic supporter of Nelva and all of independent distribution. We're lucky to have Krish Krishnan. He has 35 years of leadership experience in the global information technology and consulting space, building and leading IT organizations in more than 10 countries around the world. He has also served on the boards of various international corporations in the US and Asia Pacific. Uh, many of you will recognize Chris as the uh, president and CEO of Magnifact. Uh, prior to that, he did a, a, a leadership in a different role, leading 2,500 global professionals providing consulting and IT. Um, in, gosh, various countries, South Africa, Thailand, Greece, Philippines. Um, Chris is really has understand and built out robust vendor systems uh, during his tenure at these digital different digital corporations. He holds an electronic engineering degree from Indian, Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay and is also an alumnus of the Harvard Business School. Please welcome Chris Krishnan. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Krishnan. I'm the founder and CEO of an insure tech company called Magnifact based out of Chicago. Thanks to some of you for your very positive feedback on a couple of pieces I wrote uh, for the Perspectives magazine. Uh, Dan kindly requested me to do a short slide session covering two of those topics. Uh, one on data security best practices. That's going to be a large chunk of what I'm going to talk about. And I've also got a short uh, session on the uh, digital mobile app, the digital advisor platform that I wrote about uh, a couple of quarters ago. In this session, I'll be covering two areas that I talked about. Uh, one will be data security best practices and also the concept of a digital advisor or digital agent portal. In the uh, piece I wrote on information security, um, I had recounted my first experience with a computer virus called the marijuana virus sitting at a lab in Massachusetts in 1987, I think. Uh, interestingly enough, that virus, looking back, was not at all destructive. I mean, it caused a pandemonium in the department I worked in. It was safely put out within a couple of hours. Um, but fast forward 35 years later, uh, with the interconnectedness of everything. You've got millions of mobile gadgets, uh, millions of intelligent uh, bread toasters and smart homes and computers all talking and communicating on a constant basis. Sophistication has become really the order of the day. It's become the name of the game. And unfortunately, along with that, cybercrime is also no exception. Just like the uh, solar winds uh, breach, I think that was December last year, and another uh, incident uh, in 2015, I think, uh, where a large healthcare insurance company uh, had millions of policyholder records compromised. Uh, all this is unfortunately harsh reality, and we need to wake up to that fact. So especially, I think, the insurance industry is a more vulnerable area. It's got uh, uh, gazillions of personal uh, protected information, PHIs, uh, health information, you got credit card records, bank records, uh, many pieces of data that's going to be a cyber thief's delight. Unfortunately, on the flip side, there is a tendency on the part of many agencies to assume that, hey, you know, it's only the big guys that uh, really get targeted, and uh, we, we, we are not going to be targeted by any of the cyber hackers or cyber thieves. And unfortunately, I think that's, that's not, that, can, that cannot be farther from the truth. So in this presentation, we'll talk about the types of cyber attacks and the measures that companies can take to protect themselves against such situations. So just to look at um, some shocking facts, right? So cybercrime has inflicted trillions of dollars of damages and tarnished reputations over, over the years. Um, and uh, this is actually a shocking fact. Even I found it hard to believe when I was doing my research uh, for this topic. Uh, 360,000 uh, variants are detected every day in 2020. This is from uh, a company called Kaspersky. That's I think they make the uh, antivirus software. Uh, another example, this came from the HIPAA journal, uh, talks about 
uh, how many healthcare records were compromised in just one month in 2020. Then uh, this uh, is a study from a university that talks about how often an attack is happening um, globally, every 39 seconds, really unbelievable. And then uh, what uh, the pundits really uh, forecast is that uh, it's gonna be uh, a loss of $6 trillion in 2021. That's what a company called uh, Cybersecurity Ventures actually predicts uh, will happen as far as uh, losses are concerned. This is kind of interesting. I'll talk about ransomware in a minute. Uh, talks about an average ransom uh, of about $1.1 million per incident. So it's really amazing. Um, and then uh, the prediction is that companies are gonna pay over $20 billion towards reparation uh, in 2021. So that's, a, that's really the cost of negligence. It's really, really steep. And uh, couple that with the belief that, you know, we are small guys and we're not gonna get targeted. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the combination becomes a pretty deadly one um, at this point in time. So I'll talk about some very common culprits. Uh, these are the most common ones. I think there are about 25 to 26 types in, in all, but uh, I'll just cover the, cover the more common ones that um, will uh, uh, form local parlance um, on a, when, when people talk about viruses and security. Phishing is a, I'm going to use very layman's terms here. It's an email. It comes from, you know, something like PayPal or Amazon or Apple. I mean, it's sort of fake email from allegedly from one of those companies. And when you actually click on that uh, from details, it's going to point to some weird country, weird domain. You know that, you know, it's not a email from Apple or Amazon for that matter. The idea is that they'll tell you the account, uh, your account subscription has actually uh, terminated or is terminating and please enter your credit card details again. Lots of people fall into this trap, unfortunately. So please be careful. Again, a very simple way of uh, finding out that it's a, it's a shady email is just really moving your cursor to the uh, from tab and it's going to point to some, you know, weird domain name that you will definitely not recognize. Uh, ransomware is a, a form of malware that locks up your system. So basically what happens is the hacker would inject a piece of code in something that you inadvertently open up and uh, what happens is that your entire computer is actually locked so you can't really get data out of it, uh, which, which is a real pity because you don't have any backups, you don't really care about backing up your system because you did not believe you're going to be targeted. So it becomes a very cyclical thing. and. Um, what happens is the cost of unlocking it is going to be, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it gets really sizably big. Uh, it becomes a pretty expensive proposition. And I'm going to talk about uh, 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 attributes that can help alleviate and mitigate the situations in the, in the next slide. Drive-by downloads, I think you may have seen it. You know, it says, hey, you want a you wanna million dollars uh, coupon or uh, from Walmart or something like that, um, you know, or you want a free iPhone, uh, pops up on websites, you click on it, uh, you play with it. What happens is that uh, a, a, a viral payload, that's what you call it, a payload gets inserted uh, into your computer, you download that, and then that can actually wreak havoc um, as you use the system um, uh, going along. Uh, man in the middle, what happens here is that, let's say you're sitting in a uh, in a cafe or a cyber cafe, I'm sorry, it's just a cafe, and then you're sort of uh, looking at bank data or something, um, looking at your Chase Bank account or your Bank of America account. Uh, a cyber thief can technically, if it's not protected, if it's not encrypted, right, for whatever reason, um, a cyber thief can technically intercept that message uh, between two parties engaged in a dialogue uh, over an untrusted network or something like that, and especially with an unsecured Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi needs to have controls typically, and not all cafes uh, would really care to install that level of controls anywhere. They could technically steal all information from you and um, transmit it between two parties. But you know, the good news is that uh, the larger banks or larger financial institutions would definitely take precautions against these things. But uh, if you're dealing with a situation, uh, you know, let's say a less protected cafe or uh, dealing with an institution that's not uh, really secure, doesn't use end-to-end -end encryption, uh, then your data is at a risk, a big risk at that. Uh, 
the fifth entry, uh, I would call it a password attack. Uh, it's interesting, actually, that, um, again, um, there are over 300 billion passwords in use today, which is amazing, right? So you have a password for everything. Uh, but unfortunately, what people do with this is they either write this on a piece of paper, write this down on a piece of paper, or they use a password like 123 or 123 exclamation mark or something like that. And uh, that could be a disaster because uh, what hackers typically do is they run an algorithm or, or a program to uh, try out your password against a set of numbers. And one, two, three would be a, a, a really a, a live bait right there because you're going to fall for it. Uh, so I think um, uh, that, you know, we, we're going to talk about uh, what sort of uh, security standards are best implemented in companies, and uh, we'll definitely cover it uh, during that topic. So this slide talks about exactly uh, what sort of steps you can take to mitigate uh, risks from uh, such attacks, from cyber thieves, from cyber crime, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the simple steps you can take to protect your organization. First off, take information security seriously, please. You know, having a don't tend to shrug it off. Uh, uh, you should have a, either a person or a contractor or a company to service this aspect. Uh, it will be money well spent, believe me. Uh, companies also need to have a security audit on a periodic basis. I know the larger companies that I work with, uh, they typically have um, companies, uh, audits, or personnel uh, allocated for the staff, but uh, I would definitely encourage all of you to take it really seriously. Uh, prevention is better than cure anytime, right? So. Uh, System patches, and this is one thing that people really shrug off and say, hey, you know what, oh my God, you know, this is going to reboot five times and I got to watch it and I don't really have time for it, so I'm going to not put this patch in place. But I would say that uh, this tendency should be really not be encouraged, okay? So you should, I think uh, you have to, um, uh, you know, set aside some precious time in the day uh, to make sure that these updates uh, or security fixes typically that come from the uh, software company uh, like Microsoft or IBM for that matter, they are really there to protect you and your computer. So uh, you don't want to encounter those things. So please make sure that you set aside some time to download the patches, security patches, and make sure your operating system is up and, um, uh, up and tidy, um, really current, uh, all the patches are up to date. Uh, always use antivirus software. Um, nothing is perfect, uh, guys, we know that, uh, but I tell you it's better than nothing, right? So I would say also the uh, in the last 35 years I've seen antivirus has become a big business. I mean, so the, the, it's very, these are very sophisticated tools. Uh, so I would say they can detect a lot of virus signatures and they can very quickly quarantine them. So uh, please make sure that you have some good antivirus software uh, installed on your computers. Um, drive your company's security policy. Get some expert help. Uh, there are many things I spoke about, you know, don't have password uh, as one, two, three exclamation mark or uh, Krish one, two, three or something like that. That's just gonna spell disaster. Make sure computer screens auto lock. So for example, do not, see, you know, just uh, oh, you know, go to the water cooler or something, leave your computer screen on. That's not a good practice. Make sure that they log off every so often. So these are, again, things that a security guy may be able to uh, tell you and enforce across your company. Uh, with this uh, pandemic and such, you know, a lot of uh, re uh, remote login stuff is going on. So I would say that, you know, there are some standards for this. Uh, you know, many people are working from their home computers. They upload software, and sometimes what happens is they don't have an antivirus program on their computers. They may load up some virus along with it. So you want to prevent that sort of stuff. So, you know, there are some uh, 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 there are some very good standards like zero trust zero trust network access uh, models that will be better than VPNs, virtual private networks that are in place today. So please make sure that you've got some advice to implement uh, such services within your corporation. Make sure to protect your servers. I think, um, you know, this is basically the use of firewalls. Firewalls are like gatekeepers to your enterprise. So a very good firewall configured properly 
should protect you from intrusion intrusion and hackers okay so it will enforce a strong encryption uh, and uh, prevent data from leaving your enterprise uh, you know especially sensitive data uh, without protection so it will put some appropriate encryption uh, bits in place to make sure that the data is all uh, garbled up do not go for free cheap cloud storage i would say that the cloud is also susceptible to security breaches so there are many cheap cloud-based services out there i would say do not store sensitive information without applying all security precautions like encryptions and others but i would say one thing there are some services that will give you hipaa compliant plans you're going to pay a little extra for it but that extra is definitely worth it so i would say go for a secure reputable uh, cloud storage with a HIPAA compliant plan. That's really what I would do. Do not encourage your own, bring your own devices philosophy. You don't want people uh, bringing their USB stick and then putting it inside the personal computer or the office computer and uploading a virus right there. So I would say that uh, go with a com company supplied device philosophy recommended by some information security person. I think that's the way to do it. Such computers could be configured uh, with the USB ports locked. For example, uh, you know, in, in my, my office, what we have done is we have blocked all USB access so that uh, no one can insert a stick and either get data or insert data into the system. Um, make sure, this is kind of interesting actually, what happens is that you may have the best standards out there, but uh, you may have your, you know, you, you have your front door open uh, uh, you may have locked your back door, but you may have left the front door open if your vendors are not uh, practicing some sort of security guidelines. So make sure that your third party systems administrators, providers follow some very strict, uh, strict guidelines that they're on their side. So they are, you know, if that doesn't happen, then you've got a big problem in your hands. You've put, taken all the security precautions in place, but you've got a back door where people can actually easily get in. So that's something that I would definitely encourage that you do. Uh, email filters are, are, are um, uh, interesting. You, you should be putting email filters. Many of the popular email programs have it, but I'm assuming that you would be using a, a standard um, uh, you know, email configured for your domain, for your office. So email filters can block blacklisted senders, unknown senders, you know, things that carry a viral payload. Uh, malicious code. Uh, it can eliminate spam. Um, they can also detect phishing and uh, malicious payload. They move them to a junk folder typically. Uh, that's a great value add that you should really look into. And again, this is the ransomware example I spoke about earlier. Make sure, please, that you perform system backups. Imagine a ransomware happens despite all your precautions at least you've got a backup and someone's not going to ask you, give me a million dollars so I can get you your data back. At least you don't, you can just say, you know what, forget it. I've actually backed up all my system uh, on a daily basis. So I would say people encourage a daily backup at the minimum, uh, do a weekly backup to make sure that your data is current. Uh, lastly, but not least, uh, please communicate, uh, have your employees escalate situations very quickly. You don't want this to happen when the horses have fled the barn. So I would say that if they suspect a breach or fraud, they need to bring that to your attention immediately. So that should be a crucial part of your security training program. This quote pretty much sums up the topic of cybersecurity and the attitude that many companies often take. In my opinion, organizations should instead step up to the plate and take very swift draconian measures to secure their information. I received some uh, questions and some good feedback on a piece on a uh, agent mobile app that I wrote uh, in the winter edition of the Perspectives magazine. So I thought uh, I could spend some time uh, talking about uh, um, the concept of a digital agent or advisor portal. It's definitely not a new topic. Uh, it's been around and discussed for over 25 years now but unfortunately has never been realized. Uh, there are different shapes, different incarnations, uh, different forms of uh, what people think are uh, a good portal, but it doesn't really uh, offer a complete 360 degree view of an agent's business. The digital advisor portal, in, in my opinion, is really an agent's dream where he or she can conduct all day-to-day -day operations in one place. 
instead of having to navigate, log in and transact business across multiple systems. I've been in the IT side for over 35 years and I have seen firsthand the challenges that agents face on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought in this, sec in this session, I will talk about the overall architecture of a digital agent platform uh, and then uh, also how it can uh, possibly be achieved with the right set of minds and players coming together, united by a common purpose. So if you really look at uh, the challenges that an advisor faces on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It's, uh, first off, one of the reasons that contributes to this uh, misery is because uh, the cost of distributing embedded visualization software is really prohibitive. So what happens is most carriers restrict their slice and dice capabilities just for internal use. The second thing to consider is that uh, the back office systems at a, at a carrier are not really trivial, right? So you've got at least a dozen internal systems feeding in data to the portal. So if you start multiplying that by the number of carriers, an agent typically is contracted with the data volumes can get really frightening and astonishing and astronomical. The uh, third thing to consider is that the advisor and the carrier are these days separated by very many levels of separation. So you've got agencies, intermediate broker dealers, you've got um, sub agencies, MGAs, BGAs, NMOs, FMOs, and call, 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 call what you may, but you've got a lot of uh, intermediate players separating the advisor from the carrier. So much so that, you know, you don't have a direct line of communication as far as insurance products uh, based on region, rates, et cetera. So that's, that's a, that's a common problem that agents are facing today. And the last uh, point is pretty self-explanatory. If you look at the level of frustration, that's pretty evident. Uh, you know, technology is really far behind in this industry. I think the insurance industry, in my opinion, is still living in, in the Jurassic era. Uh, as far as technology is concerned, I mean, people have moved on with, you know, hyperscale computing and uh, AI and natural language processing and mobile computing technologies. And unfortunately, we are still far behind. So that is uh, one of the challenges that sort of needs to be addressed if we can um, move on, take it on to the next level. So I just wanted to sort of outline some of the key elements of what I, what I call a digital advisor portal or platform. While this is not an exhaustive list of all components that build up this ecosystem, uh, I have actually portrayed uh, some key elements that really make up um, uh, this portal. So what I've done is in the interest of clarity and time, I haven't really spent time talking about multiple types of CRM systems or vendors. I'm not talking much about the lead management systems or contracting systems, I've left them out. Uh, that doesn't mean that these are less important than what I'm going to present, but I just kept it uh, very succinct here. Uh, this structure, I think, will serve the purpose of what I'm trying to outline in this concept of a digital advisor portal. In, in my uh, experience, uh, there are really two pillars to this. You've got the pre-sales part, and then you've got the post-sales part, uh, both on the uh, transaction side and the analytics side. So. Let me start with the pre-sales transactions and analytics piece. Uh, I broke it down into sort of five uh, sub-pillars here uh, on the quoting side, uh, leading to EAP, to illustration, new business underwriting, and policy administration. Uh, never, you know, nevertheless, what's going to happen is in some cases, these are all intermixed. So you've got uh, one sub-pillar doing both functions. So you know, I'm not going to spend too much time trying to demarcate one from the other. The, uh, on the other side, what I did is I put all the commission calculation systems and uh, the concept of what I call ag aggregated distribution analytics, where an agent is able to access uh, data from multiple carriers at a click of a button instead of having to log in, uh, you know, look at production scores uh, from multiple carrier portals. So I just put some vendor names here. Again, uh, these are sample vendors that serve in each of the spaces. Uh, company name, names are provided only as examples, uh, and they're not depicted 
in the order of popularity or uh, uh, adoption. So I've not, you know, again, this is just to be taken as uh, illustration purposes only. So I put some vendor names against each one of those. Um, and uh, the key thing is really, you know, how do we bring it all together? So I've come up with the concept of a systems integrator role here that um, uh, companies that could really, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. It could be anybody here for that matter. But what they could do is really uh, create an API, so to speak, um, an application programming interface that would uh, really interact with each of the sub pillars and provide a single stream uh, to the user experience layer. So what could happen is, for example, instead of an agent getting into a tablet uh, or, or a mobile app or, 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 or a, a personal computer or a MacBook into each one of the systems separately, he or she is presented with one common portal where at a click of a button, that person can, that agent is able to look at, launch an e-app um, right up to consummation, uh, get a policy going, and then once the policy is all consummated uh, and, and sold, then look at uh, uh, monthly commissions or weekly commissions, and also look at all the um, uh, production across all the carriers that the agent has contracted with uh, and perform analytics on top of that. So this is really, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, right? So early movers, I believe, uh, including systems integrators and data visualization companies have got this unique opportunity to sort of partner up and deliver a very powerful single user experience to the advisor. So I think this is really what I think um, the industry is kind of ripe for and um, we have to have people moving in this direction. So what does this portal do? I think, uh, again, I mean, uh, the portal would really solve the problems I talked about earlier. It would equip the agent or advisor with very powerful analytics without uh, someone having to spend a lot of money to sponsor or buy expensive visualization software for them, which is gonna be a big uh, barrier to entry for performing analytics, uh, like I described. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you don't have to log into, you know, 25 different systems or 50 different portals to get a 360 degree view of your business or conduct your transactions. So this portal would uh, guarantee uh, to be a one stop shop for the agent's business right from uh, a browser or a mobile device with a single sign on capability. The other thing is it's going to bring uh, agencies and carriers uh, closer to agents. Um, and, you know, you've got, uh, for example, in the mobile app, you've got uh, capabilities like location sensitivity. So, for example, I'm based in Chicago. And if I'm an agent, the carrier could tell me uh, what products would really suit, suit my business based on my location, my region, my county, uh, and other bits of information. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I think uh, we spoke about lack of technology here. So uh, imagine someone really sponsoring a technology to the advisor, uh, chock full of things like predictive analytics, AI, natural language processing, and mobile computing uh, to bring the latest trends to the advisor to, so that you know the advisor feels really empowered uh, to be able to conduct uh, their business. Thank you very much for the time, opportunity, and attention. I really appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any questions on the topics I presented, please talk to your Nailbar contact, or please feel free to reach out to me at the numbers I have provided on the previous slide. Thank you very much. Have a great, wonderful afternoon. Bye.